in order to sort of break the ice a little bit about the starting phenomenon, which I think Mr. Ohanian did this morning, I'm not allowed to call him Alexis. Um, the, uh, one of the issues there is people often have misconceptions about what a startup is or what it means to start a startup. Each of you stand accused as starting a startup at some point in time. Is that correct? Mm, they cannot deny it. Um, what was it just something you learned you totally thought wrong about what a startup was or what doing a startup would be? What was something that you believed to be true that turned out to be just a total misconception? Anybody can start and can break the ice here. Um, before we just get started, I just wanted to take 30 seconds to um, uh, <laughs> uh -oh, share script. that up. <laughs> uh, Catherine Carr, who was a very oh. good friend of the uh, university community and the Charlottesville community, um, passed away earlier today. She was uh, a big advocate of the things that are happening here. She would have absolutely been here. So our thoughts are with her uh, family and friends. I just wanted to get that out there. Should but we have a moment? Sorry? Can we just take a moment of silence for Miss Kathy? Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I she would have been so excited about what's happening here because this is <laughs> yes. awesome. Yes, this she is would amazing. Have. She would have been um, a huge, uh, just, she is a, a huge fan. So I'll take a first whack all right, at that. Take a swing. I thought a startup was a small version of a big company, and it's totally a different animal. And uh, my first startup, I, I, I founded in the Czech Republic when I was 23 years old. Uh, we raised two and a half million dollars of venture capital, and I thought that I had won the lottery. And you know, we were going out and having beautiful custom deck decks installed with like sh you know glass and under lighting and like our logo and it was amazing and and uh, that was the those were the bubble days but clearly a, a startup is such a different uh, thing than just a small version of a big company and so that was the I think the major realization that happened luckily for me early on um, and then the only other thing I would add is I think there's probably as many ways to successfully start a business as there are people on this planet. And so there's probably no one exact formula, but hopefully we can just share some thoughts about how it's worked out and how it hasn't worked out for ourselves. Awesome. Anyone else? Misconception. Is this on? It is on. Oh, yes. Um, I, I just wanted to add, I uh, underestimated the degree to which things change, like just as you're, as you're going. I sort of had the idea that you have a great idea, and then you make it happen, and then everyone loves it, <laughs> and, then that's, and then you're done, right? Uh, but things are constantly changing, even for the best ideas, and your main job is to you know, keep up with those, keep your team happy throughout those changes, and just kind of keep moving. So it's almost like the rate of change and the motion is actually you know, what characterizes your success and not actually you know, having some objectively great idea. Definitely, for yeah. me, it, it really was the financial security that was the biggest shock. Like, uh, if you're a founder, you've all had that moment where you sort of, like, forget, okay, I'm not going to have a salary anymore. Um, I have this small amount of money uh, that came in from maybe your first customer, your first client, and then you're like, okay, well, maybe uh, next month we're going to have a lot more clients and it'll be okay and I can finally breathe again. Um, but what I learned is that you're always at that point where your money in your bank account is running out. And so you really have to get over sort of that fear that you're going to die because a startup can die at any moment. And so you sort of get over that really quickly um, and realize, you know, your hustle and your work effort every day is going to make it go, go by. Uh, I was going to say something I've learned over the years is that, um, you know, it, it's not all about hard work, and um, hard work's a prerequisite, it's important, but uh, hard work doesn't equal results. Um, in between those two uh, beginnings and ends is, is a process, and it, you know, that begins with the thesis, and then testing the thesis, and iterating on it, and changing it, and you know, we're, we're here at, in Charlottesville, it's an academic institution, and there's a lot of academia in the way successful startups are are, are built. Um, 
But I think having a, having a, 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 a core, uh, a strong fundamental process and staying light on your feet um, as you work through that testing and iterating phase is every bit as important as just, you know, working hard. So Peter, any misconceptions? Um, I think for me it was that, um, that I could even be an entrepreneur because I certainly, uh, uh, I'd be completely honest, like if, if uh, 20 year old me would not have expected I would have done one company, let alone four. And I think, um, I, I think that something happened <laughs> and with the, the rise of the internet that, um, and the dot com boom and everything that I think um, lowered the bar for participation and made it a lot easier for a, a lot of people to become entrepreneurs. Uh, it reminds me a lot of, um, you know, when I was young, I was, um, I'm still in the punk, but I was like a punk kid with like Mohawk and everything when I was a teenager. And I remember this uh, uh, moment when I realized I could be in a band and put out a record. And before it had always seemed like this thing that was very distant that you had to be a rock star like Kiss and have makeup and a huge band and a jet and a major label to put out a record. And it's sort of, that's what I think has happened with entrepreneurialism where you don't have to fit a certain type to do that now, which I think is great. So we had talked earlier about some sort of structure to this panel, which being founders, they all completely said was impossible to do um, and would not be willing to do actually was what happened. Um, we were talking a little bit about going from flailing to finding to flowing, but they felt like that seemed too rational. So now for a moment, if each of you could just sort of give us some highlights in your path to where you are today. Um, and then we'll go back on that, given what you've experienced, and start to think about if you were to start a new startup now, what would you do? Like, how would you do it, given what you feel like you've accumulated? Like, the actual the start, all right? Um, which is a, I would say, if I were to answer that last question, my misconception would be that there's a start. Um, that actually the beginning of a new venture is actually quite nebulous, and sometimes it happens accidental and a group of individuals look at what they've done and they're like, oh my God, is this a startup? Um, and that happens more often, I think, than people think. They're just working on something they think is interesting and before they know it, after it's blown up a few times, now it doesn't blow up anymore. And they think it's a, it's a venture. But what were some of the highlights to your path? Like as, as founders or now, Josh, you work as an investor as well. So just give people sort of a life path, your startup life path, some sense of what that was like. Um, Ms. Vanessa, let's start with you and then we'll go Josh because that'll help you guys get some structure. I have to always provide some structure. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'll just go brief highlights. Well, first, I, I started the first organization that I started. It was actually Developers for Good and I started Girl Develop It quickly after that and they didn't start as, you know, like plots to take over the world. Um, just like you said, they started as, you know, for Girl Develop It, for any of you not familiar, we help women learn to code and we do that across in-person uh, we create in-person learning environments. We have 50 chapters now. We teach thousands of women per month. And, and we do that really, we started by just saying like, can I, we wanna impact you know, the gender gap in technology. We wanna help more women get into technology. Can I help the woman next to me get more comfortable with technical skills? You know, so it started with like, can I solve this one person's problem? Um, and then from there, you know, people, people were really into it. A lot of women wanted to learn. And then we sort of developed the business model around, you know, how do we reach more people? How do we let this grow? How do we do it in a way that's in line with our values? And so I think that's really important. You know, we didn't start with like this master business plan. We just um, started taking action and people liked it and it worked. And then you'll find that when you have a lot of support and a lot of people like what you're doing, um, you end up, you know, having the breathing room and the wiggle room to test and to, you know, figure out how to grow. Um, so I think that's really important. I will say that is kind of similar to what we discussed earlier. I, 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 that took me by surprise. I, like you, Peter, I had never you know, decided to be a founder. I just sort of tried to solve problems and then found that businesses and organizations can be great ways to solve problems. Um, so another big highlight that I would mention, especially for people who are sort of aspiring founders but haven't necessarily found the ideal um, you know, your go-to idea or the thing that you think is gonna be it for you. Um, I actually worked for a startup called Paperless Post uh, and I joined there as a database engineer. I was basically able to bring the skills that I was really comfortable with into an environment where a lot of things were changing but where I wasn't responsible for everything. And I have to say, being able to be part of a growing early stage team was huge in terms of skill development, in terms of, you know, like learning about funding, learning about different uh, ways to make things happen. And it's, it's really impacted my 
my confidence and my ability. Like I, I long for the days that I had, um, you know, such a like a narrower scope of problems that I have to solve. <laughs> and now just every, everything is my problem, <laughs> um, and that's sort of the you know the burden of a founder. But I would say so. Highlights are just get started with something. Um, you know, don't necessarily think you have to have a full business plan and everything worked out before you um, just start trying things and learn. Uh, and then also, if you're interested in startups, particularly like high growth technology businesses, try to work for one first. Um, they say you can only learn by doing, and I believe that about starting a company, but I think the mechanics of growing, you know, growing a ship and kind of like redirecting things while they're going, you really can, it's nice to be able to learn that in a somewhat protected environment, and I consider funded startups a somewhat protected environment. If you can earn a salary and learn about growing a team and learn about changing a product, it's a great, um, I consider that a safe space to learn, even though I understand for some of our, for some people that doesn't sound like the most <laughs> secure environment. I would just highly recommend working for a high growth company before you start one. Yeah, Josh, what would you have to say? Um, so I'll, I'll condense 20 years into 20 seconds. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I went to another ACC school, Duke. Ooh. <coughs> <coughs> had I was to, waiting had for you to, to bring that up. I had to, uh, I had to throw that out there. Um, anyway, I went to Duke and I, uh, when I graduated, I, um, I, uh, all my friends were going to New York to, you know, do things on Wall Street or be consultants or whatever. That doesn't uh, really happen at UVA, to the best of my understanding, right? <laughs> and uh, and this, you know, it was 1998, and this this thing, the internet was happening, and um, uh, I got an opportunity to move out to San Francisco, work for an investment bank, you know, really focused basically on technology, a little bit on healthcare, called Robertson Stevens. And so I went out there, um, and I spent four years advising startups. I, I joined a small group um, that was focused on private companies instead of public ones. Um, and I spent four years advising startups and getting to work with some amazing CEOs and amazing founding teams. But after four years, I, I, I sort of felt like a hypocrite because I had been telling these CEOs what to do and, and giving them advice, but having never done it myself. And what, is a, you know, what does a 25-year-old punk know about, about raising money and, and building a business? Um, so I decided to, to take the plunge and get some real operating experience. Um, I worked at a bunch of different, a, a few different startups in, in New York, uh, but ultimately joined a team at a company called Sphere uh, in about 2006. Um, and we, we had this widget that lived on publisher sites, like the sites that Pete was running at the time. Um, and, uh, and it recommended content. Um, and that, sort of blossomed and grew. We ultimately sold it to AOL in, in 2008. Um, and I, I, I joined AOL and I, I ran the business for them for a couple of years um, uh, until things at AOL changed and there was an opportunity to uh, uh, take the business back, which we did, and we sold it to a company called Outbrain. So we resold it. And then Outbrain um, uh, grew like wildfire and I, and I got to be a part of something that was growing really quickly and becoming a, a real large business. Um, but I, I, always had a, I always had a curiosity for venture capital, and so after three years there, the business had gr grown from about 50 to 350 employees. Um, I joined SoftBank Capital two years ago. Okay. So Stephanie, how would you, it's like the last few years, what, it, what did it look like? So when I graduated, I was in a position, uh, like many people who graduate, where you have a lot of loans to pay off. And the reality of it is not everyone can jump into a startup right away, right? You know, the priority was, okay, I need to pay my bills. So I moved home and I got a job with a salary, uh, but very quickly I knew, you know, I, I really want to get involved um, in the community. I don't know what that means. I was very involved at UVA with many more organizations than I was in classes. And so I just started Googling meetups and events in DC. And um, I worked in Reston, which is about uh, like an hour and a half commute um, into DC. But every day I would look up what event was happening in DC. I would um, take the bus from Reston to West Falls Church Metro and then Metro straight into DuPont or Northwest or wherever the events were happening. Um, just to learn and get involved and figure out what I was really passionate about. Um, and because I didn't know, I was even more hungry to figure out, 
oh, this intro to HTML class. Like, hmm, that sounds interesting. I have a design background. I've been designing for lots of nonprofits when I was at UVA. Let me figure out how to bring these designs to life um, and do some front end coding. And I went to so many different meetups um, that led to a startup weekend. And for those of you who don't know what a startup weekend is, it's a 54 hour hackathon um, that happens in cities all over the world. Um, and you go in, I went in by myself, I didn't know anyone. I had just graduated like less than a month um, before and um, I met uh, a person who is now my co-founder. And this is, by the way, the exception. I don't want to you know, bring false hope to everyone that like, all you have to do is do, go to a, a hackathon and you'll find your new founders. Um, I think it was a very uh, fortunate situation that I worked really hard to get to. But um, I, we won second place. We presented our idea to the World Bank. Um, we stayed in touch, did another startup weekend a year later. We met our now second co-founder, um, won first place. Uh, I was still working at my day job, but I was bringing two laptops to work. One was my Dell, my work laptop, and one was my Mac with all of my designs. And I was doing like designs during my lunch break like crazy. I was talking to my now co-founders who I didn't know who were my co-founders then, um, and sort of like hiding away in the corner eating my lunch, but also designing logos because our next client would be National Geographic, um, the Atlantic Media Company. And we were hustling and all of a sudden, you know, media came out and our, our app was featured in Fast Company. And it got to a point where we had to pull the trigger and say, Steph, are you gonna do this full time? And I was the only one left. Like they were, they were both sort of freelancing or doing their own thing. Um, and I, I was sitting there, I had paid my last um, check for my school loans. And you know, with two immigrant parents, you sit there and you're like, I'm gonna follow my dream. And to them, they're like, what does that mean? Because for them, it's like, I just need to pay the bills. You just need to have <laughs> financial stability. Um, so I think that was the scariest point, um, sort of bringing this to like a human level of, wow, I'm really going against every cultural <laughs> point my parents have ever taught me um, to follow my dream, which is such um, an American thing. Um, but I did it. And uh, like I mentioned before, it was so terrifying because you just don't know what the next month will bring you. And you start to become so resourceful um, and even more hungry and you know I still go to tons of meetups just to learn because while I'm not at UVA anymore um, I feel like I've had a second education just from forcing myself to learn as much as I can about computer vision um, like exchanging oh I will transcribe your eight-hour lecture in order to get a free seat in your course and I think like that's that's the amazing thing about you know, moving on from the universities, your learning really doesn't stop. As long as you're hungry and can find those resources, like you can really find what you're passionate about and dive into it. Um, but I wouldn't recommend just quitting your job just because you have an idea by any means. Um, like everyone's mentioned on stage, like you have to have a problem you wanna solve. And you'll get to that point where it's like, I can no longer uh, you know, do my, my job and I need to figure out the next step the transitory move. Right. Here, I'm gonna switch to kind of going back to think about startups, because I can see this clock thing, and it goes down, it's kind of strange. Most clocks move in a forward direction, this one goes backwards. Um, and it's pressure. Uh, so you come up with, you've got an idea. Suddenly a hunch emerges, and it's not what you're doing right now. What do you do? So you're gonna now go now start a new startup, and you've been through a number of them, hopefully learned something, or learned that you didn't learn anything. Um, what are some of the first steps you would take? And in particular, we'll also come back to like, how would we think about found, oh, co-founders and stuff like this, but what are some first steps that you would take to start this next venture? Adam? Well, first of all, I'd start it in Charlottesville, Virginia, because <laughs> this is my... I like uh, that. <laughs> woo! Yeah! Um, this is my third startup that I'm working on with my beautiful wife in the audience somewhere. And uh, what I think I'm learning is that um, I think entrepreneurship is, is a craft. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. Or at least that's hopefully the trajectory that we're on. <laughs> um, I'd started in Charlottesville because Charlottesville's a great community to start a business in. Um, we've got a wonderfully supportive 
uh, group of people that live here. We've got the university, which provides uh, a plethora of young, dynamic students um, as you know, initial employees. Uh, we've got all the intellectual capital that comes with that. We've got a great place to live here in Charlottesville with an incredible quality of life where you can go hiking in Shenandoah or go on a vineyard tour. Um, the cost of running a business in Charlottesville is, is quite attractive compared to um, a lot of the places we might be competing with um, in terms of funding uh, and founding startups. So the first thing I do is I do it right here. Um, and then secondly, um, I would do it with my wife, but I don't know if she would agree with me. Okay, uh, the phrase that you used was, sorry, I have to recover from I, the phrase. I, <laughs> I selfishly thought that okay. if I start a company with my wife the third time around, I'll get to spend more time with her, and I, I actually really like spending time with her. But it's not for everyone, so if you are planning on starting a business with your spouse, the first question I would ask is, how much do I really like them? And <laughs> We re I really liked spending time with Kristen. I don't know if she would agree. Um, but basically, that's a segue to have a co-founder. Um, because starting a business is such a, such a challenging journey. No matter what, even if everything is going really, really well, you know, to be able to have a co-founder that you can bounce things off of and rely on and, and know that you're going through this adversity, this kind of slog together, um, for us, it's hopefully brought us closer together and we have a good, a better understanding and appreciation of each other um, because of it. Um, so I would say do it in Charlottesville, have a co-founder, and then... Um, That's going to be the new city moniker. Do it in Charlottesville. Do it in Charlottesville. T-shirts. <laughs> all sorts of meanings there. Um, That's so it. That's all I would let's, say. Let's, let's twist on that one a little bit. Um, co-founders. How many of you, if you started your next venture, would instinctively choose to do it with a co-founder, not alone. Okay, so those That's of you that, that didn't vote, that was sort of like an abstaining sort of vote. What, what was the, why, why were you sort of thinking about it? Peter. Uh, <laughs> I think... Is it because uh, other people just are horrible humans? No, I, okay. I, um, I think it's nice to have a co-founder. I think it's nice to have um, uh, someone else in the trenches with you when you're getting shot out by snipers, but um, and things are going really poorly because it helps. You know, the commiseration aspect is great because there are always going to be these days um, when you think to yourself, "Why am I doing this?" And uh, I, I remember about six weeks into Engadget, I just remember waking up one morning um, and thinking, "I can't write another blog post. <laughs> I cannot do it." And um, and realizing, uh, well, I can't quit now because I left Gizmodo and it was such a public thing and you know, I have to keep moving forward. Uh, but it was nice to have uh, co-founders there that I could, I could talk to about that. Uh, but I think that I would wanna do it uh, on my own now just because I, I feel like I have enough experience um, and, I, and I want to have uh, maybe something that I have complete control over uh, mm -hmm. at this point. Okay, I, I would, it's, it's more of a function of having done it enough times and being older that I feel more confident in myself. All right, so you feel like just single, not single-handedly, but you could at least get this thing in motion early. Yeah, I don't think I would, I, I, I feel, depending on what it was, but I would feel pretty confident I could do what I need to do on my own. All right, Vanessa, same thing, you kind of did that. That was like a, ha so that was like a half vote, I think. Is yeah, what I I've, um, so I heard, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember the source of where I heard this advice, but I, I heard it, you know, you know how when you hear some sort of wisdom and it doesn't seem wise at the time because you have no context and then once you live it and like make mistakes, you're like, oh, they were right. <laughs> and I had heard that before. Um, so I think having, uh, basically having great co-founders is ideal, uh, but uh, being a single founder is better than having the wrong co-founders. And that's a really hard decision to make and it's hard to know, uh, you know, who's gonna be there. But I will say just to the sort of, along the vein of co-founders, is that the number one thing, so the first action I would take in starting a new venture is to tell as many people as possible about just the vague idea. Just practice how you're talking about it. Practice, you know, tell people even if they have no, you know, um, easy to understand like connection to what you're talking about and expect that a lot of them will have no idea or will think it's a bad idea and that's okay. You wanna like, get your practice in having people discourage you early because you're just gonna get more and more of that later on. And, and don't um, worry about people stealing your idea because you should never worry about that. Absolutely, no one's gonna steal your idea and execute better on it than, than you will. It's just, it very rarely ever happens. Um, in which case you should probably be working on something different anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> harsh, harsh real talk. Um, but the other thing I would say is, um, 
if you don't, whether you have a co-founder or not, um, sort of like assembling your, your team, and that team isn't necessarily like your full-time employees. It's, um, you know, it's your personal network, it's your mentors, it's the other entrepreneurs you, who you know are in various different stages of their business, but are gonna be able to you know, give you some perspective and give you feedback on where you're at uh, at different points in time. Like getting the group of people who you can call upon for, for help, for feedback, or who just kind of care you know, how you're doing, like what's your extended family for the scope of your idea uh, is really, really essential in trying to figure out who cares about what you're doing, whether they're your customer or not, mm -hmm. is like number one task. Like share your idea to get feedback and, and like build your, you know, build your team of people that care about what and you're the doing. joiners, people that will join you. Pa Paul Graham says it really well. He says, build something people want. That's <laughs> probably pretty important too. Like, uh, and, and what that means is kind of just the like abbreviated version of, you know, don't kid yourself if you're working on it for a couple of years and you're not, you don't have any customers and people aren't getting excited about it and, you know, you really want to focus on customer development as, as quickly as possible, which means until you actually have a customer that's paying you some sort of consideration for your product or service, um, you don't really have a business. And then, you know, maybe on the West Coast, they'd say, until you have millions of users, even if you're not getting money from them, we'll monetize it later. But on the East Coast, it's generally like <laughs> revenue is I mean, a good thing. I feel like there's some East Coast, um, West Coast thing is emerging. So, so, yeah. so on that theme, because we have a few minutes left, a lot of times founders talk about how they didn't really, they started something and what turned out being was not what they started. So, which really sort of begs the question, how do you start a company when it's not going to be the one you started? So, that, that's the question. How do you approach starting when you know that it's not going to be what you started? I, I would just say, you start. You know, I was, I was, I was listening. That's way to, too. I was listening to Becca's, <laughs> I was listening to Becca's uh, presentation earlier, and I, you know, I've been following her brand for, uh, for a little while now. And, I mean, that's the perfect example. She didn't intend to start this, uh, this fashion label that is, has blossomed and become this, this thing. She just followed her passion for architecture and design and fashion, and it sprouted, you know? Uh, but, it, but the seed it was her interest. Um, and so I think, I, I think starting is the hardest part. Just, just putting your feet, put your foot down and saying, let's go. Um, it, that's the hardest part. And, you know, be free and be open to, you know, what it becomes from there. What do other folks think about that? Because they, they can also feel like anything that comes at us, we'll just try it. But um, most of us can't, well, we do need to sleep sometimes. So how do we approach that nimble, nimbleness or just of the, you know, the actions after the start? I was going to say, you know, you should fall in love with a problem and not a product. Uh, I see way too many uh, entrepreneurs and founders who they create this great product. It's really beautiful, it looks great, uh, but it doesn't really solve a problem or it really doesn't do what they think. And they keep trying to find a problem that it solves and shoehorn the product and, and, and pivot it and iterate on it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it just isn't meant to be. And the founders that are the most successful are the ones who they have a problem that they love or maybe a problem that they hate, so to speak, that uh, they want to solve. And they just keep trying to find ways to address it. And those are the ones who usually end up being successful in the end because they're willing to show the flexibility of mind and to make the tough decisions about what's best for the product to really solve that problem and make customers happy. And, you know, if you are so in love with the product that you can't, if you become blind to what needs to change in it and needs to be discarded from it to make it successful, that's one of the hugest uh, obstacles to success. I think that is so awesome. Uh, with, with Bard and Blue today, we're focused on helping introduce brides and grooms who are getting married to wedding vendors. And so we said, okay, that's the market that we're addressing and we, we are building it, we are addressing it by building a website to connect the two. But through the course of the journey, and it's been three years so far, all kinds of things pop up and all kinds of assumptions that we thought we had about the, you know, the product that we were building turn out to be false. So um, I love what Peter says about fall in love with the problem. And in a related note, I'd say go after a really big market opportunity, but at the beginning you really have to create an artificial constraint around that opportunity with borders that are manageable on a playing field that you can win on. And what we started by just launching a website for Charlottesville for helping people get married in Charlottesville. And we decided to, to segment the marketplace geographically. And so once we, we think we win on that playing field, we can expand to a new market and a new market. And that goes 
to say for, for as well for different business models. You know, how are we going to monetize the business? Or what are the values, the values that our customers are getting out of our business? Are they going to change and evolve over time? Absolutely. So yeah, if you fall in love with the problem that you're solving and a market that you're tackling, it's a lot easier to kind of maneuver and pivot uh, as necessary. So basically, if your goal with the startup is to take on the world, take on some small portion of it Absolutely, first. Yeah. So in the interest of keeping us flowing, um, let's thank the panelists, because <laughs> this thing's flashing at us. Um, so. Hopefully this conversation made it clear to you something I think Adam said really early, which is much of what being a founder is or whatever startups are, or whatever entrepreneurship is, is this sort of craft, sort of this art plus science sort of combo um, that I think returns multiple times throughout the day. Um, most of these folks, or a few of them will be joining us this evening for the Glant Challenge upstairs. Peter and Vanessa will be at the Haven tomorrow between one and three as judges in Super Demo giving similar feedback to young uh, and young. I, I find it interesting here where students refer to each other as kids, and I would never call students kids. I'm totally intrigued by that. Um, but providing feedback to some of the innovators and, and advancing ideas in and around the startup community here. So thank you to the panelists, um, and we'll move on to Mr. Dale, who's next. Thank you so much. Thank you.